Good evening and welcome to Lipscomb's virtual conversation series, where tonight we are going to take a look into the future of higher education. We are pleased that you have joined us this evening and we want to welcome all of you from the Lipscomb community, but also welcome those from the Baylor community and the higher education community across Tennessee. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have a conversation between two university presidents, Dr. Randy Lowry here at Lipscomb University and Dr. Linda Livingstone from Baylor University from Waco, Texas. And tonight was an opportunity to really have the chance to peek into a conversation of two higher education leaders who are facing head on the challenges of higher education, but also looking for the opportunities of higher education and dealing with a moment where there is pandemic and there's all sorts of external challenges, but also dealing with a moment to where there is tremendous change in the landscape of higher education. And so tonight we have the opportunity to be a part of that conversation. Uh, some of you have asked questions and uh, we'll be sure to uh, get to some of those. Uh, but really we want to now welcome uh, Dr. Randy Lowry and Dr. Linda Livingstone for this evening's conversation about what lies ahead in terms of higher education. And so with that, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Lowry. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lowry. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with you on this series and uh, to present it to uh, these audiences from literally uh, Tennessee to Texas and back. And we certainly welcome my uh, friend and uh, academic colleague, uh, Linda Livingstone. Uh, and, and Linda, is it, well, we're going to introduce you in just a moment, but uh, is it all right if uh, I just call you Linda and I'd invite you to call me Randy and let's just sit around this virtual table and visit for a few minutes? Absolutely. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Randy, and uh, thanks for the invitation and happy to be called Linda and look forward to uh, a conversation about these really interesting issues. So before we make the connection that we have uh, professionally, uh, let's just go back and learn a little tiny bit about you. Uh, let's let the audience, uh, especially this one in Tennessee, uh, kind of know, perhaps beginning with, uh, uh, well, maybe it was college basketball. Tell us about uh, that beginning and your career since then. Well, I had the, the privilege to play basketball at Oklahoma State University. I grew up not far from there, and my dad had played and coached there, so it was sort of natural that I would go to Oklahoma State. So. Uh, did my college education there, did a master's and doctorate there as well, but loved my college basketball career, met my husband, uh, kind of through that experience. He also played basketball at Oklahoma State. So uh, a strong athletic grounding while I was getting a really strong academic grounding as well. And uh, from uh, your marriage, you have a daughter who's in graduate school, I think. Is that right? That's correct. Our daughter, Shelby, is a second year Truett Seminary student working on a Master of Divinity in sport chaplaincy, sport ministry. Uh, she played volleyball at Rice University, graduated there, and then came to Baylor. So we're thrilled to have her close, and she loves what she's doing, is just thrilled about uh, what she's going to do in the future. Isn't it special to be a college president and have one of your own children at your institution? It is. It's really special. There's also a kind of a higher level of accountability as well on the decisions that we make when you've got a student uh, that lives with you sometimes that uh, 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 sort of... Uh, giving you feedback on those decisions. And so uh, after uh, college, uh, actually your uh, first teaching job was at Baylor, is that right? Yes, I had the privilege out of my PhD program at Oklahoma State to come to Baylor. I was a faculty member in the management department in the Hank Hammer School of Business. Uh, so I taught home, human resources, organizational behavior, and uh, really loved that experience. I eventually became an associate dean the last four years I was here. So my first academic experience uh, was at Baylor and uh, really grounded me well and prepared me well. And frankly, when I left, I didn't know if I'd ever be back. So it's kind of an interesting journey that I've been. And you left and went to the beach in Malibu. That's correct. I heard you were having such a good time out there, Randy, that I needed to come join you. So I decided to do that and go to Pepperdine and be the dean of the, uh, the Grassi Dio School, the business school out there. So we worked a few hundred yards apart up on that hill, and uh, then I left and came to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and to Lipscomb, and you went on to George Washington. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, I was at Pepperdine for 12 years. And just as a personal aside, Randy, uh, you and I met several times when I was first coming to Pepperdine. 
uh, to kind of talk about some of the things I would be facing in that role. And I just appreciate the insights you provided and some of the guidance. And frankly, I think it's really helped build a good foundation, certainly for what I did there, but for George Washington and even when I came to Baylor. So um, I don't know if I've ever been able to personally thank you uh, for the time you spent with me in those uh, first uh, months and years that I was at Pepperdine, but I certainly appreciate it. Well, it was a pleasure. And uh, I, I often uh, said in that life, uh, back before I was a college president and working in the area of, of conflict management, that uh, people didn't typically call if uh, everything was going well. And so uh, we had some conversations, and I, I really hope they were helpful to you. And all of us deal with difficult moments every day, so we'll help each other out as we can. And so back to Baylor. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Well, I was at George Washington, of course, was in kind of my third year there. I certainly thought that I would be there for a number of years, at least five, if not more. I loved my time there. Being in Washington, D.C. was just fabulous. My husband's a history teacher, so he loved Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, but uh, as Baylor was making some changes and transitions at that time, uh, they uh, you know, started a presidential search. And you know, eventually, I got a call from the search committee. Uh, expressing interest and you know it's sort of an interesting process Baylor was going through a very very difficult time and, uh, and and they had to be very thoughtful and deliberate about that process and that decision and so uh, but eventually uh, actually kind of late in the process um, I think you know you just you listen to what God's calling you to do you try to be open to that and um, and really began to see that all the different experiences I had in my life up to that point at Baylor, the first time at Pepperdine at DW had really, you know, begun to prepare me for what I might uh, deal with at, at Baylor and ultimately, uh, you know, had that opportunity in that office in the Board of Regents and I uh, just honored and humbled to have the opportunity to come back to Baylor and uh, love Baylor and, and really love the, the work that I've been able to do since I've been back. Well, I frankly can't remember my third year as president here. Uh, I've just started 16. But uh, take us back to that moment. Uh, you know, there is an interesting beginning with a task that is uh, not just a huge management uh, responsibility, but something that is uh, life altering as well. I mean, you become the president. You don't just serve as the president. Uh, what, what feelings and thoughts did you have in those early weeks or months of that job? Well, you know, it's interesting because I've been at Pepperdine in Los Angeles, a huge city, you know, and, and university presidents there are important, but they're not, everybody doesn't know who you are. And same in Washington, D.C., lots of great universities, but it's a big city, lots of politicians. You're, you're a little more anonymous, and you, you may feel this way in, in Nashville, but coming to Waco, particularly in the circumstances I came in, it was a big deal who they hired as a president. And I was the first woman president of a university that at that time was 173 years old. And so it got a lot of attention and everybody knew who we were. And we were not anonymous anywhere. And you guys can't tell this on the, on the Zoom, but I'm six foot tall, my husband is 6'10", my daughter is 6'30". We don't go anywhere that people don't know who we are. <laughs> And uh, it, it, it was so obvious. So the very first day we drove in, we drove over uh, Memorial Day weekend because I was starting June 1st. And uh, so we come in on like a Sunday night and we're staying at a temporary house until our, the president's home is ready and we have no food or anything. So we decided to go to HEB, which is a big you know, uh, uh, grocery chain here. And like, you know, I'm in my sweats and my hair's not fixed. I don't have any makeup on. And, I'm thinking, we're just going to run into HEB and grab stuff and leave. And so we walk in and like, we haven't been in the store two minutes. And somebody goes, oh my gosh, you're President Livingstone, aren't you? And then, you know, we're going, yeah, and we had a nice conversation. And then, okay, let's get in and out of here so we can, you know, not be seen looking like this the first time I met as president. And then we're going around and all of a sudden I hear these college women like going, oh my gosh, you just kind of hear them kind of, uh, having this conversation and my daughter comes up and she goes, mom, those are Baylor students and they think you're the president and you need to go talk to them. So I walked over there and they're like, oh my gosh, you're the president. And they're just like so excited to see me. And I'm thinking, who gets that excited about a college president, right? And then they wanted to take selfies with me. And so honestly, like we have taken, especially that first year, 
thousands of selfies. So we very quickly realized that no matter where we are, we are the president and the first family, we represent Baylor, and we're in this kind of community where uh, you're recognized. And, and frankly, we don't go anywhere on vacation. I was in an airport in Africa and had somebody recognize me. So, you know, it, if you know how this is, I mean, you kind of become more of a public figure than you ever thought that you would be. And it takes a little getting used to, but then you kind of adapt and it's just part of the life that you live. Well, it is both uh, an irritation occasionally, but it's also a great joy, isn't it? it that, is. uh, you have these thousands and thousands of alumni. We have half of our alumni live in two counties in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron and I say, you can't go anywhere. Yeah. And you really can't, but what a joy when you get to meet them and share the story and engage yeah. them. It does well, open up a lot of opportunities to talk about these great things that have happened. You had a couple of years that uh, must have been fairly normal and then last March came and uh, whatever the normal was for you as a president changed uh, fairly quickly when we realized that uh, COVID was not going to be something restricted to China. Uh, it was going to be in Europe and shortly in the United States. Uh, help us understand this moment where as a college president, you're now facing something that you don't control. Yeah, well, you know, much like all college presidents, we sort of began dealing with this in this early in January because we had students studying internationally at the time. And so we were very aware of what was going on globally and trying to make decisions about what to do with our students studying abroad, but didn't really know how it was gonna impact us. And as we got into March, we began to recognize it might. And, and this is kind of the seminal moment for me. We were in Kansas City uh, at the Big 12 basketball tournament, the men's and women's tournament for the Big 12 were in Kansas City. And we were having meetings almost daily with the Big 12 board of directors, which is all the presidents and, and chancellors, and trying to decide what to do with the tournament. And I just remember starkly, I think it was March 12th, but I could be wrong on the exact date. We had a call that morning. The men's tournament was starting at like 11 o'clock that morning with the first game. The women's tournament started the next day. Our men played that night, so they were getting ready. Our women were getting on a plane in Waco to fly to Kansas City. And at about 10.30 that morning, we decided that we had to cancel the tournament, that we just didn't know enough, it wasn't safe enough, and we had to cancel the tournament. So Texas and Texas Tech were already warming up on the court, and they had to pull them off the court. We had to call our women's basketball coach, Kim Mulkey, and tell her to have the plane turn around and not take off because they weren't going to get to play. And then it was very soon after that. We'd already extended spring break a week. It was a few days after that we just canceled the or went fully online for the rest of the semester. So I just had this stark remembrance of that day and that experience. It was later that day that they canceled the NCAA basketball tournament. And um, we had two teams ranked in the top two or three in the country. So, you know, for a lot of reasons, it was devastating to us. So it, it was just such a seminal moment. And all of a sudden, you're just like, oh my gosh, this is something we've never dealt with before. And we're going to have to you know, bring our A game to figure out how to adapt in the moment about something we know very little about. And I think we both uh, survived uh, March and yeah. made those changes, but those changes affected every student and every faculty member. And I think called uh, the team that's around us as presidents to really do their very, very best work. And uh, it was fun, I think, to see them step up and step into that and uh, then we got to summer and the looming question in the summer was, do we open or not? Mm -hmm. And uh, as people wrote about that question in our higher education world, uh, you know, one person described it as the, the most important ethical que uh, question that presidents will have to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, do we open or not? Because literally uh, the lives of members of our community were resting on that decision. Yeah. Uh, how did you make it and what happened then this semester at Baylor? Well, as you know, it was a very difficult decision to make. And, and one of the things as I reflect back on it, uh, obviously my team was critical. And I, I have a wonderful, we call it President's Council um, with a diverse set of skills and perspectives, several of whom we've hired recently to come in from different places and bring different perspectives. But the other thing that was really important to us is we put other experts around us. So we created a health management team we, that is health experts, environmental health, public health, a consulting firm we worked with, some of our anthropologists, our health services people on campus. And then we also had a task force we called 824, 
that look at every single possible thing, at least what we thought were all the possible decisions and issues we had to look at if we were going to open on August 24th. And so we spent, you know, every day for months following, fo focusing solely on how we could open in August. So we started with the assumption that we were going to open uh, and work towards that. And then that's the back, the, the, the back end was if we can't figure out we can't do this, then we'll go online. Now we prepared to do that if we had to, but our default was to open. And I think that was that mindset was different. And then we trusted experts that had more health, environmental science, public health knowledge than my team did to advise us as we made decisions. And then the other thing was critical is we worked really closely with our board and kept them informed, made sure they were walking with us and were uh, understood where we were and why we were there as we went along. Uh, so, you know, these were unbelievably difficult decisions. And I think we all look back and, uh, you know, we opened successfully, we made it through the semester successfully, but that was really only because of really great and talented people going way above and beyond. And really, frankly, adapting on a daily basis as we learn new things. You know, we changed a lot of things along the way that we wouldn't have thought about in June or July, but that we realized in September we needed to do. And so as a, uh, as a business school professor, as a management professor, uh, obviously this will be a case study at some point when we look at different kinds of organizations that responded. Our story here is very much like yours. We made the decision to open. Uh, we did everything we could think of to prepare for that. And like Baylor, uh, we're at the end of the semester and it was a successful semester, both in terms of health and in terms of academics. Um, what, would you, what would you say about this if you were a professor standing in front of a classroom five years from now? What, what was the management skill that was essential in the moment? I think um, the ability to adapt and be flexible was just absolutely critical. And we're, we're criticized a lot in higher education for uh, not being very flexible and critical to us. Um, and I think that was most important, I think, data, being data driven, following the data. Sometimes you want to sort of react uh, emotionally to something or there's a lot of political pressures around this stuff. But at the end of the day, when we're an academic institution, we better pay attention to the data. Um, and um, the other thing that was really important to us and it has been very helpful, again, we're accused of being very siloed in higher education. We really, you just couldn't be siloed and deal with that stuff. And all of our task forces were uh, university-wide, uh, we really relied on whoever was the expert, whoever had the best knowledge and the best skills. So it didn't matter where they were from. And honestly, we have found some unbelievably talented people on our campus doing things we didn't actually know we had the skills to do. Mm -hmm. And we're going to just be a lot better at a lot of things going forward because of, of some of those um, challenges we faced and, and what we learned about how to adapt and, and change quickly along the way. One of the, th one of the things I will be proud of was a moment when we realized there were a number of people that had nothing to do because oh, whatever uh -huh. their job was, yeah. what was gone at least for a period of weeks or months. And, and I was so impressed with the number of people that said, well, then reassign me and you know, where else can I go? And all of a sudden you had people uh, who were doing radically different things than the job they had and yet doing them well. And in some cases, they're not going back to the old job. They, they like the new one. So that adaptability is a, is a wonderful characteristic. Well, and so you know, step we had that same thing happen. And, you know, and I know this happened at all universities, but I would say, I think on our Christian university and college campuses, this idea of sort of the selfless service to the institution and, and really caring about our students in a deep way and being willing to kind of sacrifice what you might want to be. I think we saw that over and over in our faculty and staff and frankly in our students to really do what we asked them to do and frankly do things that they, like you said, have never done before. So I'm sure you saw that same thing. And, and again, I think you see it on all college campuses, but I think at Christian institutions, um, we probably saw that on a deeper level and um, on, a, on a level that's actually more deeply tied to our mission as Christian institutions. I think that's true. I uh, have had a numerous conversations with our city and state officials 
that tend to put Lipscomb in the same category of lots of other universities you might read about. And I've had to remind them, you know, you're dealing with an institution where students are drawn into something because of their character. And I think they're gonna work through this just fine. And uh, they, they really have. Let me ask you to do this. Let's get a little bit broader and think about uh, just the pressures of this industry we call higher education. Yeah. You know, one of the amazing things about America is we have uh, the diversity of higher education that uh, virtually no other country has. And it's technical schools and community colleges and private schools, state universities, this, this wonderful uh, collection. And yet our industry is under a lot of pressure. What, uh, what pressures are you waking up and dealing with and thinking about? Yeah. No, I think on a very broad level, just higher education broadly is dealing with, you know, questions and concerns about the cost and the debt our students face and is the value there uh, for, for what students are paying or what their uh, debt might be. You know, we're seeing demographic changes that, I mean, that our, our the college age population is going to decline uh, in, in the coming years. The college age population is is a different makeup than it used to be in terms of diversity, where it's coming from across the country that we're going to have to deal with. Um, and then, you know, I think there's a lot of conversation about what should we be preparing students for in higher education. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of pressure to prepare people for jobs and careers, which we certainly need to do. Or we want our students to be successful professionally. But as an academic institution, we also want to prepare students to think and and have a really strong kind of liberal arts background and, and, and to be uh, good citizens of the world even beyond just the kind of job they might have. And so I think these really broad questions uh, are important to all of us in higher education. But then I think when you drill down to Christian institutions of higher education, uh, you, you lay across that a kind of a unique mission, which I actually think the more unique universities' missions are in the years ahead, the better that is for them. We know there's been a lot of talk about consolidation and, and mergers and acquisitions and universities not being successful financially, and certainly the COVID pressures make that worse. And so what institutions are going to be uh, successful in that? And I think unique missions, particularly those are deeply value-based and are driven by a mission that is really looks beyond itself are, are going to be really important uh, in, in dealing with kind of some of these future challenges. And you probably are seeing some of those same issues and pressures at Lipscomb uh, in the same way we do at Baylor. And so here we are in this industry, and uh, I would guess every day you meet with parents, uh, informally mm -hmm. at least, and uh, tell us what you tell those parents about uh, this investment that might result in some debt and might take some real sacrifice, uh, might not uh, be easy to accomplish, but what do you tell them the value is and the benefit is? Mm -hmm. Well, there's certainly the data you can look at that just shows that students that have a college degree just uh, earn more. And so there's sort of the standard kind of data that you can provide, which is important. And I think it's important for us to understand that. But uh, I think particularly when you're at a, a, a faith-based university, a Christian university like uh, Baylor and Lipscomb, you know, part of the message is we're about a lot more than just educating your students academically. We are about their spiritual development. We're about their personal and professional growth, about their civic engagement. And we want your student to leave this place uh, a a more well-rounded human being that is really prepared to do what they, they care about, what they love, uh, and to really make a difference in the world and to really think deeply about what that means and what it means to, to live out a faith-based life in a meaningful way after you leave here. And you, you just can't get that at a lot of places. And so there's huge value in Christian higher education. So David Lipscomb uh, early on wrote and said that he was establishing this school in 1891 uh, in order to prepare young people for their careers, but also to give them a sense of character mm -hmm. to take into their lives. And, and that piece is important to you and to me and to our institutions. Uh, let me ask you about technology. Boy, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I kid, although I, it's not really... Uh, a joke, but I kid about the fact that 
uh, it would have taken me a decade to get our faculty to go online. Uh, and they did it remarkably in two weeks because mm -hmm. we had no choice last March. Uh, all of a sudden, every student in America, I, I think, uh, has studied online and every faculty member in America has, has now taught online. How is technology going to influence us as we go forward? Well, we had a similar experience. Only 8% of our total faculty had taught a fully online class before March of last year. And by April of last year, 100% of them had done that. And you're absolutely right. That would have been such a heavy lift. Now, many of them, and they've learned and they've worked so hard. I can't say enough about our faculty. I'm sure you had the same experience. But just their deep commitment to figuring it out quickly and then developing even more over the summer to, to do what they needed to online in the fall. But I think technology is going to have a big impact on us on several levels. One, I think just how we do work unrelated in some ways, the sort of support mechanisms behind it that we'll do differently because of, of what we've learned. I think that we'll do in alumni engagement and even student recruitment, we'll have learned some things that even when we go back face to face, we will enhance that with remote opportunities that frankly have, I mean, just like this conversation tonight, you and I were doing this in Nashville face-to-face, -face, you know, we have a certain audience there, but this actually gives you the opportunity to have a national audience. And, you know, that's a great opportunity that we need to continue to take advantage of. On the learning side, I think all of our faculty, whether they ever teach online again after this semester, will have learned some things about designing the course and using technology that will make them better. It will give us much more flexibility going forward. And then I think the other thing we learned is students really want to be face to face. I mean, we sort of had all these predictions that face to face education was going to go away. And we learned very quickly when we did that, when face to face went away, that students and parents and families, especially of younger, you know, traditional college age students, really need that face to face personal connection. So I think it's just reinforced the value of the residential education model with technology used to enhance and enrich that experience, uh, but not to replace that experience. So I think one of our opportunities is how do we use technology to even further enable a rich, engaged residential experience going forward in ways we've never thought to do in the past. So I think we've got tremendous opportunities um, because we've sort of been forced to learn on the fly how to do some of these things. So we often talk about, uh, you know, in a challenge, there's both danger and opportunity. Uh, that's certainly true in terms of technology, but I think you're so right. Last summer, when we finally made the decision to say, we're going to open a residential campus, uh, it was the voice of the students uh, that, that pushed us over saying, we want to come back to college mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. definition uh, to a large degree as a residential campus. Well, and so the thing they've missed the most this fall is as much of the traditional face-to-face -face engaged activity. We built in as much of that as we could safely. <laughs> but again, they want more and more of it, not less. And so right. I think that bodes well uh, for the future of residential higher education, frankly, especially for Christian higher education. So let's uh, talk about Christian for a moment because we're both in a segment uh, I think there are about 4,700 colleges and universities in America. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, 130 that are part of the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. There are several hundred more uh, that claim a strong faith basis and walk that out. But it's several hundred out of almost 5,000. And so Baylor is walking that journey. We're walking that journey. Um, is there a place for a Christian university in a culture that, well, it seems not to be as churched and it seems to be growing more secular? Uh, how do you articulate what you bring to the table? Well, I think in the circumstances you described, it's actually even more important that we have institutions of Christian higher education. And it's interesting, in my inaugural address, which was in October of 2017, one of the things I said was that the world needs a Baylor. The world needs a, a Christian research institution because there just aren't many of them. And so you need, a vo you need voices in higher education that come from different perspectives and you need that faith-based perspective. And when we talk about it as a research university, we say, you know, all truth is God's truth. 
So what higher calling could you have than to discover the truth of God, to teach about God's truth, and to apply God's truth in the world to solve really difficult problems that are out there. And that faith-based voice in that research, teaching, and application element is important to have in the midst of lots of other voices that are out there like you described earlier. And so I think it's critical that we have Christian voices in higher education. I think we have a responsibility as Christian institutions of higher education to, to champion that and to do everything we can to be engaged and involved in those conversations so that we do have influence on the direction of higher education and, and really give students opportunities for uh, education that they might not get otherwise if, if we don't exist. So I had a conversation with someone in our community uh, a few months ago, and we were talking, and, and he was very, very, uh, frankly, impressed with the impact students were having through the 200 social service organizations we work with and a whole bunch of community stuff. But he ended his compliment uh, by saying, I just love all that you're doing. I just wish you weren't Christian. And I thought, what an interesting perspective, because at least for us, doing those things comes deeply from a sense of faith, mm -hmm. and we're motivated by that faith, and yet just the whole sense of being kind of religious bothered him. Mm -hmm. How do we navigate this in that world? Well, I think it's, it's a great question, and, and uh, you know, I think we've all probably had those similar conversations with folks, and um, I think part of it is how we as Christian institutions engage with those who might believe different than us or not believe at all and, you know, find, try to find common ground on those things that we can and, and work together on those things that we can, even if some of our values may not perfectly align, uh, because we're going to have to resolve some of these problems. And I think it helps them understand us better and maybe be open to the conversation about those faith underpinnings and why we do that. So uh, I, I love that you you were at uh, Pepperdine and uh, Daryl Tippins was at Pepperdine. He was our provost out there. And he talked a lot about radical hospitality as a Christian institution. And I believe one of the examples he gave was you sort of set the table and you invite people to come around the table and anybody that wants to can come and, and join with you and eat with you. Uh, but it doesn't mean you change what you serve or anything, but you welcome people that be in conversation with you about these important issues. And so I think uh, having that openness while staying true to our values and our convictions is really important to uh, helping the people feel more comfortable with our role in higher education and understanding the unique and important impact that we have. And so here we are in a very special segment, and I, I think you're right, a segment that, you know, frankly, in the history of higher education uh, was fairly prominent. Most yeah. of our private Absolutely. institutions in America uh, began as faith-based and uh, religiously oriented uh, institutions. Well, we'll continue that, uh, that world. Uh, as, as you keep Baylor on its track to be a, a great university, and as we look at what presidents do across the country. Uh, one of the things we do is we ask for money. Uh, you, you probably have learned to do a lot more of that. And uh, we do that because of the way higher education is financed and uh, the future of our institutions. Say a word or two about generosity as it relates to uh, our work and uh, this segment of higher education. Well, you know, it is so critical to our success as private institutions, but particularly as private Christian institutions that we have family, friends, alumni, parents that come alongside us to help support our mission and our uh, vision for our institutions. And we've been unbelievably blessed at Baylor. I think that, you know, and I, I suspect it's the same way at Lipscomb, folks that go through Baylor feel a deep, uh, emotional and personal connection to the institution, and they want it to continue to be successful. And so they've been very, very generous. We're in the middle of a very large campaign that we hope to, to uh, close out in the next couple of years, and been unbelievably successful and a great participation from broadly across our community. But we really can't do what we need. We can't make our education affordable to uh, students who are qualified and want to be at a Christian institution. 
uh, without the support and help of our uh, donors and family and friends. And uh, it's really critical to our success and critical to us being able to continue our mission for those students that need it most and have the least ability uh, to, to pay for this kind of education without, without help from uh, scholarships and, and other means. So I can't say enough about how important it is and just how much we appreciate the generosity of so many people, certainly at Baylor, but across uh, the Christian higher education landscape. Well, again, private higher education in America is this unique, uh, this unique segment. Uh, you know, at least when I go to Europe, they don't understand us. They don't understand a private university, don't understand our dependence upon the generosity of people. Uh, let me have you, you think about this for a moment. Uh, I heard it not long ago, and I think it's so true uh, that often we as presidents uh, don't ask people to give to the institution. We ask them to give through the institution. Mm -hmm. That, that our goal is not just to build the institution. Yeah, we'll build new buildings and all that. But the value of a gift is really something that goes through what we have built to have an impact in the life of a student or in a community or a research program or whatever that might be. Uh, how do people give to your institution but give through your institution? You know, one of the things I talk a lot about is that in many ways, the impact of Baylor is less about in many ways what we do, it, certainly what we do at Baylor while students are here is huge, but it's when they leave here and go out into the world and do what they do so well, whether it's in education, healthcare, or business, or theater, you know, in, in the arts or whatever it might be. And so by giving, you are helping us prepare a student to go out and have a huge broad impact in the world. So in many ways you're giving isn't just having an impact on Baylor, it's having an impact on the world as these students who had the privilege of going to a place like Baylor or Lipscomb go out and make a difference in the world. So it's the impact is just multiplied many, many times over far beyond the walls of the institution. And, and I think that's an important part of it to, to see the, uh, the systemic impact of what giving even a small amount can have on not the institution, but the people who didn't go out and have an impact I can't believe that uh, there aren't researchers tonight that were trained at some college somewhere uh, that are relieved because they figured out a solution to a virus. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that didn't come because uh, it just happened to come. It came because they were educated and that education has been applied and we're all going to be the beneficiary uh, of that. Uh, let, let's spend the last few minutes yeah, let me be a little bit personal, can I? And kind of uh, tiptoe into the world of, of, of your presidency and your work because uh, you're doing a great job. You've been great at other institutions. And, you know, I, I think, well, you're almost like the mayor of a small city. Uh, and I don't know Texas all that well, but, you know, I would guess you've got your own medical stuff, your own mm -hmm. security and police stuff, and you've got uh, all the ways that you serve students, uh, your own social workers. Your, I mean, it's like a little city you're a mayor of. Yeah. And you go home at night with the burden of that in addition to the joy. Um, tell us what part of the job is most difficult and what part is most rewarding. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's kind of two sides of the same coin because it's about our students. And so I think the most difficult part is when we have to do, when we have painful things that happen to or with our students. And we had a, a student suicide a, a, about a year or so ago and deeply painful and hurtful. And you, you have to take on a different role as president in, in nurturing and caring for and really pastoring the community and the family and when I came, I had met with sexual assault uh, survivors. Uh, and to hear and feel their pain and deal with that um, is hard. It's important and we need to do it as part of the healing and reconciliation process. Um, but it's a hard part of the job. Um, and you hope you don't have to do that too often. You hope you put in process places that help avoid these kinds of things happening. But on the flip side of that, the greatest joy 
is being around our students and seeing the amazing and talented work that they're doing, the difference they're making, watching their lives transform during the time they're here, and then following them uh, as they leave and seeing what they do in life afterwards and just be hearing about the impact their experience that Baylor had is the greatest joy that I think you can have in a job like this as well. So, uh, you know, the joy and the pain of being present is tied very deeply to, uh, to the connectedness of our students. So react to this quote, you know, the uh, famous business writer, Peter Drucker, mm -hmm. uh, late in his life, uh, I had a chance to hear him uh, speak at a Red Cross function. He was actually in a wheelchair and, you know, maybe 90 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was fairly old and, uh, Later in his life, he began to look at nonprofit organizations in a, a really special way and concluded at one point uh, that the most difficult job in, the, in America uh, was the, either the job of being a hospital administrator uh, or a college president. Uh, do you think he's right? Well, I haven't been a hospital administrator, and uh, so I have a little hard time comparing. I will say my first board chair when I first started this job was a retired healthcare system CEO, and he would claim that my job was harder than his, but I'm not going to make that claim myself. I do think those these positions are challenging because you do have people in your care every day on a large scale, and we have young people in our care, and there's a huge burden that goes along with that, um, and as we said, great opportunity as well. And then we're in a very regulated environment. Healthcare and education are probably some of the most regulated industries in the country. And so navigating within that and the, the implications, the constraints, the opportunities that provide. Um, and then there's a lot, we have a lot of constituents that care deeply about what we do. Students, parents, alumni, legislators, uh, you know, the public in some ways, depending on what kind of institution, the church community, if you're a faith-based institution, and they don't always agree on what you should do. And those pressures don't always pull you in the same direction. And so there are a lot of pressures, but I don't know, I kind of find that to be part of the joy and challenge of it is to figure out how to navigate the, kind of the, uh, the complexities of it, the messiness of it, and, and to make progress and to make a difference um, even amidst the challenges, that's, I think, a lot of the fun of what we do. Well, I, uh, I quickly admit when I use that quote that uh, there are people on my campus uh, that have harder jobs than I do. Oh, there are I people agree. That work all night long. There are people that take care of huge problems when they happen. And so I don't want to claim that, but I, I think uh, you got to where I, I wanted you to, to go, and that is a sense that there's a complexity to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the regulation, the concern about students, and the, all of that makes it uh, just a job that uh, is complex as we try to serve people that we uh, really love and, and appreciate. So let me ask you one last question. Okay. It's been a wonderful time being with you, and it's just so good to renew uh, a little bit of friendship here in front of hundreds of people <laughs> and uh, to, uh, to know you're doing so well there. Uh, when it's all over. Uh, when you finish this uh, chapter in your career and you've been the steward of this institution, um, what, what do you want your legacy to be? Yeah. I think in many ways, our legacy is the people that we have touched and, and, and influenced at our institution. And so, you know, part of that is, is did we develop students while I was here, certainly not because of me necessarily, that have really gone out and made a difference. And, and then the other piece, and this may be more relevant to me personally, is are there now, are people at the institution now going to carry on the institution consistent with its mission and uh, in a way that, that the, they're the legacy that I leave as the team that I hired, the people that they hired that are going to carry on the important work of our Christian university um, because a university isn't anything independent of the people that make it up. And uh, who we hire at a Christian university, how we develop and mentor those people is, I think, the most important thing we do to sustain the integrity of who we are and what we do as a Christian university. So I think that 
is the legacy in many ways uh, and the ability to sustain over the long run uh, who we are and what we have been for the last 175 years as a profession. Well, thank you, Linda, for uh, what you do uh, for higher education, uh, for Christian higher education, for Baylor University, but thank you even more for who you are. Uh, I appreciate uh, the example you set, uh, the faith that you walk out, uh, and the impact you have. Uh, thank you for being with us this evening. Shall oh, it was a pleasure, Randy. Thank you for asking me, and uh, so glad to be able to join you this evening. Thank you, Dr. Lowry, and thank you, Dr. Livingstone, for a fascinating conversation and giving us a peek into the mind and heart of being a college president, but also for your insights in terms of the future of higher education, something that we all care passionately about, whether we're a faculty member or whether we're a donor or a student or someone engaged in this very important mission in some way. Uh, the future is bright and the future is important, and we appreciate you all reminding us of that tonight. I wanna to welcome you and invite you back on January 12th for our next installment of the Lipscomb University Virtual Conversation Series. Uh, we will look at the future of racial reconciliation and we are thrilled to have David M. Bailey that will be join us, joining us that evening. David is the CEO and the founder of Arabon, an organization that works with very large churches and large organizations helping them and equipping them to think about racial reconciliation with cultural intelligence. And so we want to invite you back for this very important conversation after the first of the year. Until then, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. God bless you. Have a great evening. <laughs>